Welcome to part two of a travel health overview brought to you by rainforesteducation.com. And any food that's handled a lot during preparation might make you sick. And one particular concern is hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is a virus that you get from eating food that's been contaminated with that virus. And the way this happens, most children in underdeveloped countries get hepatitis A when they're infants. And they don't even get particularly sick with it. Uh, they might have a little diarrhea off and on for a month or so. Uh, and after that, they're immune for life. But what happens generally is that mom is taking care of the kid at home. Uh, she then comes to work and makes your lunch. And perhaps there's not running water and soap at home. Uh, maybe mom hasn't scrubbed her hands really well. And you eat the virus, then you get sick. And as an adult, if you haven't had hepatitis A and you get sick, you're sick for a couple of months and you are really sick. Hepatitis A is a huge problem in large parts of the world, uh, especially the Andes, uh, parts of the Middle East, parts of Asia, uh, but you can get it anywhere. And fortunately, there's a really excellent vaccine. One shot of this vaccine gives you 95% protection. A second shot is recommended six months later, which pretty much makes you immune for life. Now, the incubation period of hepatitis A is, is six to eight weeks. So if you came into my office today and you were leaving for the Andes tomorrow, I would still give you a hepatitis A vaccine because even if you got exposed tomorrow, this vaccine would make the illness not so bad. So this is probably the most important vaccine for most travelers. I don't necessarily recommend this vaccine for a short trip to the Caribbean or Cancun or Costa Rica, uh, places that ha generally uh, have fairly, li uh, fairly high levels of hygiene. But if you're going to be traveling much in your lifetime, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and get the vaccine. And wherever you go, food that is well cooked and served hot is generally safe to eat. This is a chef in Lima, Peru, uh, serving up some paella, and uh, amazingly, he is even wearing gloves. But eating in the marketplace around the world uh, can be a, a fun experience as well as a source of a, a pretty cheap meal, uh, as long as you're smart when you eat in the marketplace and pick foods that are generally safe to eat. Well, what's safe to eat? Well, fresh fruit or vegetables that you peel yourself are most likely going to be safe to eat. Again, foods that are handled a lot by other people are not going to be so safe. Food that is, again, well cooked and served hot is generally going to be safe to eat. And in various places around the world, you can get corn on the cob uh, cooked right in the marketplace. In southern Mexico and throughout Mexico, you can get tamales steamed right in the marketplace and sold to you wrapped up in their corn leaves, so they're absolutely safe. Hot rice dishes, uh, beef heart kebabs uh, in Peru, uh, chicken satay uh, in Indonesia, all of these things are, are well cooked, served hot, not handled after they're cooked these things are going to be safe to eat. And of course, if you have the luxury of being able to do your own cooking, that broadens your experience quite a bit. These are live crabs for sale in the marketplace in Santiago, Atitlan, Guatemala, uh, that are conveniently uh, tied up on a little stick with strips of corn leaves, and you just take them home and drop them in your pot of water, uh, and you've got uh, dinner. Not every hazard when we travel comes with a warning, like this tree that has a nice sign that says danger poisonous fruit. So it's often very nice to ask a knowledgeable local you know, what kind of hazards you might encounter uh, in the area, especially depending on activities that you might be involved in. You know, in parts of this country, when you travel, when you hike out west, you have to be very careful where you put your feet, where you put your hands. You might encounter rattlesnakes, black widow spiders, things like that. Well, that's certainly true in large parts of the world. So if you're out in, in the rainforest, if you're in undeveloped places, uh, just, you know, think about hazards like a poisonous insects and venomous snakes and just be careful where you put your hands and feet. Uh, again, asking a, a knowledgeable local can be very important. And of course, uh, other hazards exist, larger hazards, for instance, uh, and, and even in our country, uh, in Florida, you probably don't want to swim in the freshwater uh, lakes and streams, especially at night, uh, or you might encounter uh, something like this that can easily uh, ruin your vacation uh, for sure. Uh, so ask the locals. Uh, this guy here is about 12 feet long, and he's certainly capable of killing an adult. Uh, so you got to be real careful. So it brings up the question, what animal is most responsible 
uh, for killing humans in, in our planet. And I see this all the time, even a National Geographic special talked about it's not crocodiles, it's hippos, it's not lions, it's hippos, uh, that, you know, hippos are responsible for more deaths than any other animal, and they cite, like, you know, a couple of dozen deaths per year. Uh, people who say this are way wrong. They are dead wrong. What animal kills more people? I'll show you. This is an Anopheles mosquito and it is responsible for the spread of malaria which kills a million people a year, many of them children. Malaria is often a risk for travelers. Malaria is a parasite that invades your bloodstream and multiplies within your blood cells breaking them apart. They can also invade your liver and your brain and kill you, especially children or adults who have never had any exposure. There's no vaccine for malaria but there are medicines that will prevent malaria. This map shows areas in the Eastern Hemisphere that have malaria. And this map shows the Western Hemisphere areas that have malaria. There's some very important things that you need to know about malaria. First of all, malaria is spread by a mosquito that bites at night. And in large parts of the world, this mosquito doesn't exist in urban areas. Uh, in parts of India and in much of Africa that's not the case. But in areas such as South America and Asia uh, if you are in a city you are not at risk for malaria. Also if you're at high elevations like this map shows that the whole country of Peru uh, is at risk for malaria but that's not true if you're high up in the mountains where there are a few mosquitoes you're not at risk for malaria. So, to protect yourself from malaria, not only do you need to use mosquito repellent, insect repellent, but sleeping in an air-conditioned room, sleeping in a screen room, using bed nets if you're out in the wild, uh, along with a repellent, these are all important at helping you not come in contact with malaria, as well as taking anti-malaria medications. Because of the urban-rural differentiation. Uh, although there's plenty of malaria in Asia, most American travelers to Asia who are going there on business, for example, uh, are not at risk for malaria. They're staying in the cities, they're sleeping in air-conditioned hotels. On the other hand, if you're going on safari in East Africa, you have a huge risk for malaria. You're going to be out sitting around a campfire, you're going to be out at night looking for lions, uh, you're going to get bit by the Anopheles mosquito. It's very, very important to talk to somebody about making sure you're taking the correct anti-malarial medication. And malaria has become resistant to some of the anti-malarial medications, so it depends on where you go which anti-malarial you want to take. Another disease spread by mosquitoes is yellow fever. Now, yellow fever is not very common, but if you get it, you have a 50% chance of dying. So you really don't want to get it. There is an extremely effective vaccine against yellow fever. It's very important that you get this if you're going to be exposed or potentially exposed to yellow fever. But yellow fever vaccine is also necessary uh, to travel around without having a lot of problems at border crossings. And the tropical areas of South America are also at risk for yellow fever. Now yellow fever vaccine is the only vaccine with one small exception that you absolutely have to have and have it documented to be able to travel to certain places. The key to remember about yellow fever vaccine is that you know these countries aren't as worried about your getting yellow fever as they are about your bringing it into their country. So you know, you can travel to Peru or Brazil without having yellow fever vaccine, and it doesn't matter if you're going to Lima or if you're going to Rio, you're not going to be exposed to it. But if you go into the Amazon basin, either in Peru or Brazil, you could possibly get yellow fever, and you better have the vaccine. But again, you don't need the vaccine to go to these countries. However, if you've been to Peru, and you try to go to Brazil within 10 days of leaving Peru, they won't let you in if you can't prove that you have the vaccine because they don't want you bringing the yellow fever into their country and they don't know where you went in Peru. And in fact, there are a lot of countries that aren't in the yellow fever endemic zone, countries in Asia, countries in the Caribbean, they won't let you in if you've been to 
someplace that has yellow fever within the past 10 days unless you can prove that you have a vaccine. There hasn't been yellow fever in Asia or the Caribbean in quite a few years. They don't want you bringing it in. So yellow fever vaccine is very important to have and to have documented if you're going to be going to one of these countries. Yellow fever vaccine is good for 10 years. And yellow fever vaccine has to be obtained from a specially licensed clinic. The state health departments uh, license uh, providers who can provide yellow fever vaccine because it has uh, fairly stringent uh, storage uh, requirements and administration requirements. And when you get yellow fever vaccine, they will give you an international certificate of vaccination, also called a yellow card, and it will document your yellow fever vaccine. Uh, again, the vaccine is good for 10 years, so you need to keep this. Uh, it's the same size as a passport, uh, very conveniently, uh, and most people keep it with their passport, so they'll have this uh, when they travel. The, the vaccine clinic or the travel clinic will also uh, document other vaccinations that you have in here, although generally you don't have to prove that you have those to anyone, uh, again with one exception.